I, um, I was going to show some slides and some photos, and I thought, you know, the early hour, you're not going to pay attention to me if I put photos up there. And uh, when they give you a, a speech like come in and talk to the visionaries and the leaders of the Canada's charitable sector when you may be considered a rebel against, I thought, well, let's do everything we can just to keep you focused on some of the message that I want to bring without throwing tomatoes and eggs and distracting you with video so I could sneak out. So the video will be right at the end when I try to run out the door. Um, so my name's Raul Singh. I'm a, I'm a city paramedic. And uh, gosh, I've been an emergency worker now 20, over 21 years, if you can imagine. I'm at that point in my life where I've been an emergency worker longer than I've not been an emergency worker. And uh, a number of years ago, I started this little agency called Global Medic. First, I want to just tell you what Global Medic is and, and what it does uh, for those of you that haven't you know, heard of it and heard of what we do. So Global Medic's the operational arm, or one of the operational arms of the David McCantney Gibson Foundation. David was my best friend. He passed away in 98, and I wanted to do something to honor his memory, so I started a charity or a foundation um, in, his, in his name. So DMGF, or the David McCantney Gibson Foundation, is not a cool and sexy name on the streets of Baghdad when you're trying to deliver aid. Nobody knows what it means. But Global Medic, people kind of get what that is. So that's, that's the name that we use on our operational arm. We do two things. We run capacity building programs, and we provide disaster response services. So from a capacity building point of view, emergency workers, professional rescuers, paramedics, police officers, firefighters, volunteer their time. They schedule out a year in advance that they're going to be away. They volunteer their vacation. They pay their own way. They go to places like Cambodia, Sri Lanka. They build schools. They train other emergency workers. And they, they do this empowerment piece or this passing of capacity, passing of knowledge. One of the greatest programs that we run from a capacity building point of view is it, it actually makes Canada really proud and we don't, we don't advertise it enough. You know, as Canadians, we take to the streets. Just look at, for those folks here in Toronto, look how many times there's protests up on University Avenue. We take to the streets to stop wars. We take to the streets to protest for peace and we're ecstatic that when our efforts can actually stop armies from fighting. But what happens is we forget that societies can't really rebuild and go on until the remnants of those wars are removed. Landmines, unexploded ordnance. For example, the most current case, Libya. We have an operational team in Libya, and you'd be thinking, well, what's going on in Libya? We know that Gaddafi's on the run. We know that the rebels are winning, but did we know? And we also know that we've got Canadian fighter jets in the air that are taking out certain elements of Gaddafi's uh, armored movements, right? But did we know that one in eight, so one in nine of these missiles that people fire do not explode? and are left laying there at the side of the road on the sidewalk for kids to come and pick up, when I guarantee you that's when they'll explode. So here we have medics that go out, risk their lives, and support UXO removers, these detonators, they'll people that will come in and blow these rockets up in place or collect them and put them into a stockpile. We have our medics volunteer their time to go out all around the world and train medics to go out and work with these landmine clearance teams because no one's going to build Walmart in the suburbs of Cambodia. No one's going to build a school. No one's going to help, you know, time to restart in these countries until the threat of munitions and mines are gone. And no one is going to go in and remove those mines without medical support. How could we ask anyone to do that? So the fact that our Canadian medics get to go out there to these different countries, the Iraqs, the Sri Lankas, the Angolas, the Afghanistans of the world, and train local folks and how to save the lives of their countrymen while they're removing the threat of this war to allow that country to rebuild, I think it's the, the coolest thing that we do. Certainly not what we're known for, but what we do, we were out there six to ten times every single year. A team just came back from Iraq. Uh, one of our female instructors, I did say female, one of our female instructors just finished a month-long mission in Somalia, of all places, where she was so well received and delivered incredible training. So, I mean, these are places that not all of us want a vacation in, right? And these are places that we work. So that's capacity building. But what we're known for is disaster response. And uh, we provide three services. We've got what's called a rapid response team, right? This, this gigantic unit. We're modular based, which means within that rapid response team is there's three separate sections or units as we call them. There's a search and rescue unit, a water purification unit, an emergency medical unit. Search and rescue, really simple, right? These are guys that get on the rubble pile when there's a structural collapse, try to pull all this rubble off and, and save grandma's life in the building, right? Pull the baby out of the building. It's compelling. It's not really that effective from a, a dollar donor point of view to actually saving lives. You look at Haiti, 
We've dumped $58 million as the world to pull 112 people out of these buildings in the first four days. And then for the next six weeks, we couldn't get another $100 million into that country to keep people alive. Right? It's a very aggressive, it's a, it's a terrific looking thing, and I'm sure if you're the one who's pulled out of the rubble, you're ecstatic that teams like this exist. But at the end of the day, it's not the, the biggest bang for the buck donor-wise. Emergency medical units. We use inflatable, deployable field hospitals, these things that they use up in the Arctic Circle to provide uh, uh, barracks and accommodation and lunch rooms for people working on refineries. Can you imagine that? What someone would use, you know, eat their lunch in in the Arctic Circle is a shelter that we'll deploy, put up in about 15 minutes in the middle of anywhere that can withstand a Category 2 hurricane, and it becomes an inflatable field hospital. It's neat that we could take Canadian technology and just innovate it and apply it to this, uh, to this setting. I, I, think it's, I think it's really nifty. And the best part of it is although they were designed in Calgary, they're actually made in some small town in Newfoundland. So when we deploy out to Bangladesh for the floods, it's across Canada that is our backbone. You know, the, the, the builders in Newfoundland, the designers in Calgary, the pilots off Air Canada that fly it in for us. And then there we are working in this truly innovative Canadian re response, right? The, um, the cost of health care, you know, I, I wish the minister was here. Maybe we'd end up running health care in Ontario. We can get health care out for about $4.30 a patient. That includes a workup, an assessment, exam by the doctor, and then the medicines. Can you imagine? I think Ontario is a little higher price than that. The, um, the last unit is the emergency water unit. We're kind of known for that. Uh, it's, it's one of the things that we do really well, and it's probably the most important thing that we do. Because you think of this, if people don't have clean water, they're constantly going to be a patient, aren't they? They're constantly going to be sick. It doesn't matter that I treated them yesterday and gave them Cipro and all these wonderful drugs. What's going to happen tomorrow? They're going to go home, they're going to drink this dirty water, they're going to come right back and they're going to be resistant to the drug I just gave them, right? So it doesn't matter how many doctors you bring, it doesn't matter how many hospitals you bring, how many medicines, the 1,500 patients you treated that day will come back to you if you don't get them clean water. So if I could only do one thing on a deployment, it would be getting people clean water. Now, um, I want to put into perspective just how good we are at getting, at getting folks clean drinking water. In the last, uh, last year, sorry, in the last four years, We've given out over a quarter of a billion water purification tablets to produce 10 times that in, in water, so 2.5 billion. Can you imagine a quarter of a billion of these water purification tablets? We're a tiny little agency in Toronto. It makes us the number two in the world. I'm not sure if you've heard of number one. They're a small agency, UNICEF. To think that we're number two in the amount of water tablets distributed is uh, it's just a nifty feather in our cap. I'll give you an example of a, you know, some of you, you must be stats people, right? Your, your, your CEOs, your, your people that run these agencies, you want to hear the stats. In 2010, global medic teams trained in six different countries. We managed to train over 70 medics. So I think that's phenomenal that 70 people got training so that these teams could be mobilized and their countries could restart. But on the disaster side, we went out to four different countries a number of times. We went to the Chile earthquake in February of 2010. We went to the hurricanes in St. Lucia, Hurricane Tomas in, in the fall of 2010. But the most memorable would probably be Haiti, remember January 2010, and the Pakistan floods. Do you know the Pakistan floods affected 20 million people? And yet, probably the only disaster that comes to mind for 2010 to us would be Haiti, right? So those four disasters combined, our medics treated over 37,000 patients. 37,000 patients. Our water units, they produced over 26 million liters of clean drinking water. That's a great number, 26 million. We got about 75 million water purification tablets out the door, and then we trained those 70 medics. So that is what we did in a year, to give you a statistical analysis. Now, here we are 10 years, 12 years down the road, and we're a well-known agency, an agency that's known for doing the work, right? Probably infamous for critiquing the government, not always the best way to get donor money from the feds. Um, but still necessary, right? We have to forge our way and punch our way out of that paper bag and, and tell the government when they're wrong, because I hate to tell you this, the government's wrong quite often, and it needs to be reminded, right? The, you were supposed to laugh at that last remark. I'm, somebody didn't put the applause sign up. The, um, you know, what I wanted to do is I wanted to just tell you how it started, you know, and everyone always says, well, there must be a great story behind how Global Medic started, 
you know, what is it? Is it, you know, what exactly happened? But it's a terrible story. I'll, I'll just tell you, you know, people say, you must be driven by, you know, giving and good. And, and no, the opposite. I'm driven by anger and hate half the time. And uh, nobody ever believes me. So a number of years ago, back in the mid-90s, you know, um, I was unceremoniously dumped out of my marriage. Someone forgot to tell me. And um, I, I, was, I was grumpy. You know, I, I, I left my job in policing and uh, tried to save this marriage, and the marriage ended. And uh, the worst of all, I was losing my hair. And um, I, ended up, I ended up buying a ticket to backpack around the world because I thought, let me go find myself. Does, does this sound familiar? Maybe this is some of your kids talking right now. Then, uh, and of course, I backpacked around the world, and I ended up, you know, all these stories start in a bar, right? I ended up in a bar in Nepal. And uh, I met this guy who was running a hospital. He says, why don't you come and train my medics? So I thought, you know what? Two weeks. What's two weeks in my life? Let me go in, train a bunch of guys that, you know, let, this could be fun, right? Bought a brick of cheese, a two-liter bottle of Coke, a bottle of ketchup, a book, and a Marvin Gaye tribute album on Walkman, on a, on a cassette, and hiked up into the mountains. And, you know, two weeks turned into the Marvin Gaye tribute. Gets you? That's great. Yeah. The, uh, I still have the cassette. The, um, <laughs> so um, hiked up into the mountains and uh, worked in this little hospital. It was phenomenal. You know, dealing with, you know, these guys in their, in their rescue unit that cared about their community, and it was like, wow, this is cool. Then the, the neatest thing happened. The monsoon floods, the monsoon rains came in, the floods came in, and we were deployed to go try and help some folks. And, and I ended up, you know, running my team, and then slowly but surely, well, I'm sure it wasn't slowly and surely, I'm sure it was a lot of me barking and grumping and throwing my weight around, which is considerable. And um, I ended up running this op. I ended up running this operation. I thought to myself, wow, this is the coolest thing ever. You can affect so many lives and keep people alive. And it was, it was the neatest thing I'd ever done. And day in and day out, sun up to sun down, high in the, or in the valleys of some of these you know, Himalayas, I, you know, I was running an op. I was, I was living the dream. You know, and it, it's funny because it all came to a crashing end. We get a call. It wasn't even a call. It was a runner that came into the mountains to tell us there's no more money. You're, we've run out of money after X number of weeks of this, res of this response. You cannot treat any more patients. You cannot give any more water. There are no more bags of rice to hand out. Can you imagine that? But there's good news, kid. We like the way you run things. We want you to come out, meet the country director, and we're considering offering you a job to go around the world and deliver aid, right? Hike all the way out of the mountains. Now, in Nepal, I'm a little larger than the average Nepalese male, which means that when I'm sleeping in a hammock at night, it's in the flood water. <laughs> it's not above. Certain amount of chafing that goes on when you sleep in flood water at night. But how am I going to complain, right? People are dying next to us. People need assistance. And how are we going to complain, right? So hiking out was not fun. Hiked out of the mountains and was brought to Kathmandu. Anybody ever been to Kathmandu? People in the hall? Beautiful place, right? Beautiful, spectacular place, poor. 80% of the population lived on under a buck a day, right? 30 bucks a month, unbelievable. And I walked into this five-star hotel where this country manager was staying. I couldn't believe it. 180 bucks US a night. I'm treating patients for $4. I'm feeding families for six bucks a week. C couldn't you have stayed in the guest house? The hammock next to me was open. Could have stayed in that. And, and my brain is just going insane thinking about this $22 pepper steak meal. 22 bucks. I mean, this is 1997 or 98, 97, 98. You know, like $22. Basically, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a worker's monthly wage. And this is what we're having for dinner. And you're going to tell me that we don't have the money? Now, there's one thing I'm really lousy at, biting my tongue. And, uh, woo, did I light this guy up. Do you remember that job? <laughs> it was gone. And um, I came back, and I was livid, pissed off to think that all this effort and good work, and then somewhere in this bureaucracy is this void where some of that effort, and we could debate all day what percentage it is, right? But some of that effort gets lost. 
So my best friend dies a few weeks later. And you know when you're in that emotional, tremendous time, you're like, oh, what am I going to do? I go to his funeral. He's a social worker. He lives in Hamilton. 220 people at his funeral. I'll be lucky to get six. And here we are, and all these people are coming up to me and telling me how special David was, right? And I'm thinking, selfish me has been backpacking around the world, didn't even know my friend was sick, right? So I thought right then and there, you know, I said, you know what? I'm going to start an agency, and the agency is going to put emergency workers into the field because they're good at that. If you think about it, at 3.30 in the morning, when someone's rolled over their car in the pouring, freezing rain and is in a ditch, that's what we deal with. How do I get this guy out of the car? Get him onto a board, get him to a trauma center in these miserable conditions with not enough hands. That's the type of mentality that we should be putting into a disaster, chaotic situation, right? So I thought, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to set this agency up, and uh, one of the things we're going to do is there'll be absolutely no overhead, no pepper steak, no five star hotels. 1998, he passed away, we set up the agency, and it's been slow and slow and slow. 2002, we get our charitable status from CETA, or from the, the CRA. $8,500, our donations for the year. $8,500. Ridiculous, right? Last year we did $1.4 million. It's a phenomenal rise. And I gave you the results, right? 37,000 patients treated 26 million liters of water, enough tablets that produce 700 million liters of clean water, 70 medics trained. It's the, it's the coolest thing. So in order to keep true to form, I'm still a medic. In fact, when I leave here, I hope not to run into you because I'll be in uniform working on the truck. And if I run into you, it's not a good thing for you. But, um, you know, this is how we keep it true to form. You know, everyone volunteers in. We've got 1,000 volunteers now that are ready to go. I've got a few minutes left now that I've explained to you who we are, how we are, and what we've done. I want to share with you some of the challenges of, and you know this already. I, I mean, I'm probably preaching in a converted, but i got five minutes, so I'm going to do it anyway. You run agencies, you're all leaders, right? Anybody ever had a tough choice to make? Hands up, you made a tough choice? Anybody ever feel wrong about making a tough choice or feel that that, that choice was a mistake? Anybody ever get to the point where you just want to throw your hands in the air and just walk away and forget that you run this agency or that you do any of this work? Maybe go live in Maui and surf, learn to surf. So when the earthquake in Haiti happened, our team was operational 61 hours after the quake. That means my surgeons were removing limbs 61 hours and 30 minutes after that quake. That means my water engineers were giving water to people. Uh, I'll give you the summation of Haiti, and then, I'll, and then I'll get into this story. We had three responses into Haiti, material aid, water, and medical. We treated 7,000 patients, 400 of them were surgical cases. I use that term nicely, it just means we removed 400 limbs. Very few people had their fractures reset. And it kills me to think that had we been there just a day earlier, we may have been able to set some of these limbs instead of losing them, right? The... Um, Patients would get treated. We ended up setting up these water purification systems and these water purification units. And when we were fully up and running, you know, about eight, nine days into the op, we were giving out a million liters of water a week. You compare that. That's a military mechanized movement team is what that is. A million liters of water a week. That's about 47,000 people every single day relying on our unit for water, right? Like, and you think about it. When the UN is in Haiti, these poor guys from the UN that were there after the quake, and everything comes crumbling down, and they see all the people in the streets dying for water, what do they do? They fill these gigantic container trucks with water, they throw a bunch of chlorine into it. If you're, gonna, if you're that guy putting the chlorine in there, you're gonna put the right amount or maybe a little more? Probably just a little more because you wanna be safe and sure. And then this truck rumbles down the street, they turn on the tats and people chase it from behind. That's all they can do, that's all they've got. Right? I'm, I don't, I'm not trying to be critical of what they did, that response of giving people water is terrible. But if it's all you've got, you make the tough choice. You're going to do it, right? What we ended up doing is we took these kids from local neighborhoods that wanted to volunteer for us, right? And they all had the same story. Mom's in the hospital because she was trapped and is losing an arm. They have to watch their kids, you know, their brothers and sisters. If they're lucky, they've got a tarp and they're living in this university compound next to where we are. But every day, they're going to come over, and they want to volunteer because they understand that we are running water units to get everyone clean water in the area and that we need help. Can you imagine the courage here? 
So what we would do is we would put these kids out onto different street corners in pockets of Haiti with a motorcycle, a portable water machine, the pipes are broken, water's running. We'd fill these filthy barrels with it and then purify that water and give it right out to the locals. Does this not sound like the most insane idea to you? Isn't it? Doesn't it sound crazy? Where's the security? Where are these people going to get robbed? Are they going to get killed? Is the mob mentality going to take them over? Talk about a Hail Mary. We set it up. We made sure all the kids were from that neighborhood. We put them into the corner. The mobs would run in. And quite the opposite would happen. It's not 500 bags of rice on a truck that has this finite number of aid, right? The kids would be like, hey, hey, I'm going to be here every single day. I'll be here from 8 to 4, 8.30 to 4.30. You'll get your water. Don't worry about it. And the people that would come flying up in line would realize, this kid played soccer with my kid. I taught this kid in elementary school. They knew this person. There was a certain level of trust, right? And then they would just come, and it would be the most orderly fashion. They'd leave their buckets and water holders there, and they'd leave. I have no idea how they knew whose was who, but they would just leave. They would go, and they would come back when it was their turn to get their No chaos, no fighting, nobody dying. It was unbelievable. And I remember sitting there. We had the troops. We had security. We had armed people ready to pull these kids out when we first tried it. But it worked, and within... Five days, we've got 30 motorcycles spread across our little sector of the city. And within nine days, we've got 64 water units up and running. A million and, you know, just over a million liters of water a week. It was spectacular. And in the middle of all that, at five in the morning, at five in the morning, I get a little tap on the shoulder from the armed gunman that's protecting our camp. This woman's brought twins to be seen. And uh, you know, I've been a medic too long. You look at one of the kids, they're eight days old, born four days before the quake. There were triplets, one died on the quake. You look at the kid and you're like, you're going to die. And the other one's got a chance. So how do you mount this as a decision? It's the middle of the night. It's 5 a.m. It's four days after the quake. We've got to get over here for neonatal intensive care. Neonatal intensive care. It's hard enough to get here in the city. In Haiti post-quake, right? So how do you balance the needs of these two infants, one that you know will die? versus the seven, 800 patients that are in your hospital that need to be seen. So here's a tough choice, and a choice I wish I could take back. I chose to take these kids to this Israeli facility and lose half a day with two of my medics costing these other people their care that my medics could have given them, right? And of course, I said, you know what I'll do? I'll take one of the kids, because I didn't really want any of my team to lose an eight-day-old, right? I thought, ah, I'll do it. Sure enough, halfway there, the kid dies. And it's one of these things where, you know, as a medic and you work in the city, kids don't die in your truck. You keep them alive, you get them to sick kids, they can die in the hospital. You will give them every effort you can. But sometimes there's a time where you just want to throw your hands up. And this is Haiti, post-quake, thousands of people dying, gunmen on the street at night, 3,000 armed criminals back on the loose because the prison came down. And a little eight-day-old infant that represented Haiti that died in my arms in this truck while I'm trying to get through the screaming crowds to a hospital, and my driver wants to fire his 9 millimeter through the roof to clear the traffic. Can you imagine? Just the chaos and the aggravation. I remember wrapping the kid up and handing him back to mom, and she didn't know he was dead. And so she, she cuddles him, maybe in the back seat of this Land Cruiser, the Brampton medic, Sean Large, a hero, an absolute Canadian hero, doing everything he can in this yoga position, keeping this child alive. This kid has a shot. We get to the Israeli facility. We hand these kids off. We manage to grab some bone saws because we've ours are broken. This is, this is Haiti in a nutshell. And I remember driving back feeling absolutely defeated. Absolutely defeated. Thinking, what are we doing here? We can't even keep an infant alive. Driving all the way back. And you got to keep a game face on because what are you going to do? You're going to pull out? There's thousands upon thousands of people that need you. Get all the way back and uh, trying to keep this game face, and all I want to do is scream, and all I want to do is walk out the door. And this kid, Romulus Jean Baptiste Pietrangelo, how's that for a name? Mom's in my hospital. I took, we took off her arm the night before. Brothers and sisters are in our tented city. And Romulus is out there, he shaved his head because he wanted to look like me. What's wrong with this kid? He starts growing in his goatee. 
and he comes back and he tells me about the three orphanages that he just found for us to install our portable water units so that 44, 4,500 more people, kids, moms, people seeking refuge, can get clean water. And here's a kid who up until two days ago was a soul singer in search of work and is now my lead water guy to get out into the field and install these portable units. So sometimes the things you create remind you of why you created them. And I'll tell you this, I'm very proud of the people at Global Medic. I'm very proud of what we do. And there's certain things that I know. I know that there are times with all the disasters in the world that it seems like the world around us is crumbling. And in response to that, many people, many people in this room, in fact, many of you will pray. Many others will throw their hands up and just wonder why. You know, take that, take that pause and go, what is going on? But the men and women that volunteer for Global Medic, they'll be there, they'll respond, and they'll provide hope. Thank you. A little over my time, sorry. Well, Rahul, you said you uh, traveled the world to find yourself. I think you did. And uh, thank you for sharing your wonderful story with us today. It's a pleasure to have you here.